All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about spirituality and sustainability. So the first thing I want to start by saying is that in the last module, we talked about some really big concepts, and we haven't yet gotten to breaking down all these different pieces of organizing, like base building, assessment, campaign development, etc. So why are we putting this module in here now? Well, the reason is, is because we actually think that a lot of courses like this use spirituality and sustainability as a finisher off. It's sort of the final piece to send forward participants into experiences. We actually think organizing is a lot of work. and It takes um, spiritual discipline, spiritual development, spiritual muscularity throughout that work. So we wanted to put this as module number two to help us use spirituality and sustainability as a conversation that's a touchstone throughout the other modules. So that's why we are here. So I want to start with telling you a little story. Last time we talked about how I had been doing organizing work for about 15 years. And I was a co-director, which meant that I also had a lot of administrative supervision, fundraising responsibilities inside of a nonprofit structure for a lot of years. And when I was in the year about eight out of a full 10 years of co-directorship, one of the organizers that I had worked with for a long time pulled me aside and said, Caitlin, when I first started working with you, we used to go do outreach in little gay bars in small southern towns. And you would sit down with someone and you would listen to them and their stories. And the way that you would look at them, it was like time stopped. The whole room stopped. They were the only person that existed and their story was the only one in the world. And she said, Caitlin, I haven't seen you do that in at least two years. I haven't seen you listen to someone like that in at least two years. And it was really hard to hear. It was really hard to hear because I had thought of myself as a person, as a popular educator, meaning simply an educator who was able to talk about concepts in a way that was really accessible for folks and led with the idea that everybody has a piece of the pie to understand what's going on in our world and to walk away um, with much more informed of the whole pie. I felt like man, I thought that was something I was really good at. As an organizer, it's something I really valued. And I realized that I was so caught up in the daily stresses of running organization, of thinking about time-limited campaigns with specific goals, being under a lot of criticism and attack from people outside and of myself, that I had stopped having that ability to listen. I just didn't have it. And I realized that I wanted to get that back because I wanted to stay in this work. Um, it was a really hard time in my life as an organizer. And it led to me um, doing some real quiet listening myself to what was going on and trying to actually absorb information about what I was seeing. And it led to some pretty big changes in terms of my role as an organizer and as a leader. I changed organizations. I changed kind of work. I think things became clear to me in some of that quiet space, um, driving around in my car by myself that I hadn't known before. So I wanted to share that because I think sometimes it's easy when someone's teaching a course or instructing other people to act like they're the expert on everything and they've got it down. And this is a process that's ongoing. So Let's broaden that into some thoughts on why the spiritual part of this work is hard. So the heart of organizing is about people. People coming to their power, people working together collectively to make change, people dealing with power relationships, and people confronting power. So many of our spiritual trials come from trying to work together well. So a lot of kind of work take, takes a lot out of people. Um, in a variety of different ways. We know that organizing is not physical labor in the same way that picking cucumbers is, in the same way that working in a factory is, in the same way of being a prison guard because that's your only option for a job is. It's not the same kind of spiritual, psychological, or physical toll. But it is the kind of work that means you have to really engage with how people are doing and you're going to hear a lot of stuff that's hard to hear, and you're going to be dealing with 
really hard dynamics between people. And so I say this because many of us who are organizers don't feel very validated in why um, we feel like this work is spiritually hard. And we think, oh, well, if we talk about it spiritually hard, are we saying that we're just privileging our individual self-care over what the community needs? Um, the, the problems are so large and the bleeding points of communities are so deep. Who are we to get to say that um, it's spiritually taxing work? And yet, I think if we think about some of the nuts and bolts of the work, it'll be really clear part of why it's so spiritually taxing and why it's so important that we have some spiritual resources to bring to it. So many core elements of organizing require spiritual growth and stamina from us. Here's a couple of examples. Base building. Base building is building a group unified around an organization or a goal. So I don't know if any of you have ever tried to do something with two or three people, let alone 25. People have a hard time working with each other, even when they are very, very similar to each other, let alone when you're dealing with massive structural inequalities um, and structural oppression off you know, long histories um, of oppression for different communities. So you start working across race, class, culture, gender, sexuality, ability, and you're having an even more complicated conversation about who needs what from a group, how quickly it wants to do that, um, how and when it wants to move, who controls the agenda. All of these issues are up in a particular way, and they take, for most people, um, a deep store of of patience, of flexibility, of being able to be open in the face of conflict, a whole bunch of skills, right? One-on-ones. One-on-ones, sometimes called one-two-ones, are meetings with other leaders and new leaders that happen between yourself as a lead organizer and one other person, or helping two other people have a connection with each other. They are incredibly time-consuming. When they are done well, they require a great deal of emotional energy, listening, and talking. Um, and they're one of the most effective ways to build um, groups, to build relationships, to build coalitions and alliances, to build campaigns. Um, they, and they take, they take a lot. Um, I think personally, I used to be able to do 14 in a day and feel like I'd pull them all off well. Um, now I think maybe if I do four or five a day, I'm feeling really good. I can still do 14 sometimes, but then I really, um, I think there's real questions about how, you know, the final ones in my day are. Um, leadership development, identifying and training new leaders. I think that having the sort of emotional sense or some would say real connection to some people call it the magic of organizing. Some people call it just really listening and being aware of where other people are at. To be able to identify potential leaders and not have it just be about your bias, about who you like more or less, who you want to be around more or less, who you think is cute, that can come into play, um, takes a great amount of paying attention. And training new leaders is one of the most um, difficult struggles with your ego that any experienced leader will have to uh, deal with. It takes a lot of accompaniment, it takes a lot of patience, and it takes a lot of willingness to not make it about yourself and try to make someone in your own image, but help them play the role that they're here to play in movement. And finally, direct action. Confronting power directly, non-compliance in the face of a lot of pressure to comply with oppressive laws, policies, cultural norms, is incredibly exhausting for some people, especially if you're used to being inside of that cultural norm and can be incredibly exhilarating, followed with, you know, deeply enraging for people who are constantly being normalized um, and pushed into normalization in terms of ability, in terms of race, in terms of class, gender, or in, gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, so remembering that there's a whole wealth of either emotional spectrum that people go through or there's real questions of how do you accompany people who might be having really different experiences than you are and then finally not on this written list but i think is important is campaigns so let's just introduce the most basic concept of campaigns here campaigns are actually picking a demand 
something your base or group wants and setting a time limited project to go get it, right? Um, so a campaign to change the local policy around the way your city is policed would be one example, um, is a really good example of a campaign. Campaigns, we're going to come back to them more, but there is a correlation. Many organizers leave organizing after the completion of campaigns. And some people think that people leave after campaigns because they have lost they lost the demand, they lost the campaign. But actually what I found anecdotally and has been confirmed by many other organizers is that many organizers also leave after they win campaigns because they're so incredibly grueling. Um, they often move very quickly. They can be um, very exhausting and they can burn out a base or um, a set of relationships between leaders. So these are some of the reasons that I think um, the spiritual part is hard. Um, a little note on non-compliance for those who might not be familiar with the term, which definitely is um, relevant to both direct action and, and a definition of campaigns. Non-compliance essentially means it's a tactic that refers to not complying with a law. Um, so for many folks who have been involved in immigrant rights struggles and are familiar with SB 1070, um, in Arizona, a lot of the struggle was around not complying to fundamentally hateful, racist um, laws that had to do with undocumented folks. So it's actually a long tradition of saying, we're not going to comply with this because it's not inside of our values. And a lot of both secular organizing and faith-based organizing have used tactics of non-compliance. There's definitely some interesting things in the book, This is an Uprising, about um, non-compliance as a tactic. And, how it relates to what's called strategic nonviolence, which means nonviolence that you may or may not believe that nonviolence is the way inside of your values, but you're using it strategically. Okay, some thoughts on why the sustainability part is hard. So for folks who hear this word sustainability thrown around, like what is that? It actually means being able to stay in, in a way that you continue to replenish the resources inside yourself, inside of the collective, inside of the work you're doing. So why is sustainability hard? Again, with the organizers, I hear a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-blame um, when they're privately very close to being burned out or fried. Um, I also see a lot of folks that are early into organizing who feel close to burnout in their first six to nine months. And that raises some real flags about how we quote onboard organizers into movement, right? There are a lot of different moments where we need accompaniment support around this. Um, so it's a long process to train organizers, but many of us leave the work after the first five years, though some come back. Why? So um, we don't need to get into a big data debate about when organizers leave this kind of work. Um, I don't have any statistical analysis on that. I just, after many years in the work, I've noticed that there is a shelf life where people tend to leave. Um, here are some of the reasons that I've heard out of the hundreds of organizers that I've worked with, some of the things people name. First, basic needs. We're not paid enough, we can't support our kids or elders, we don't have health insurance, ableism is at play, and more. So particularly if folks are, I've seen brilliant organizers with disabilities who are not getting the support they need around accessibility, who are literally being shut out of the work. Time and energy demands, 24-7, 365 and we care so much. So what does that mean? It means that we are constantly either actively working or on call um, and we don't necessarily have the support or sometimes the resources to challenge us and to actually raise the questions to be able to um, take the time we need to make sure we're bringing our best. You know, sometimes you'll hear the argument from organizers that the work is so pressing, they just don't feel like they can take a break. Um, I've been there and I definitely feel like there's a lot of organizers that I've worked with who are even more directly affected and are feeling like every single day that they're not working is a day that um, one of their trans sisters of color might lose their life. We cannot, question the quote legitimacy or self-determination of organizers who that is their experience it's absolutely true i would also hold 
that there is some nuance and complexity there because sometimes when we have to step in with ourselves or other people step in with us or with each other, it's because we are so tired and so fried that we go in on a Saturday afternoon and we completely destroy an alliance, a coalition, or a campaign group because we are so negative, we are so pessimistic, our reads are off, um, and we just kill the morale. And without the morale and hope, people might see that as a soft skill, but actually without that, you can't motivate people. And you can't motivate people, you can't organize. So there's a very important, I think, both and that we need to be talking about inside this conversation. Another reason that organizers leave is infighting. Groups, leaders, and organizations fighting due to personalities or different politics or different goals. Again, going back to morale, this is incredibly demoralizing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more, and I hope that people will talk with each other a little bit more in this course about infighting and the current climate of, of hypercriticism in organizing. There are really important critiques coming out about organizations and leaders and movements that we, they're rich and they're important, we have to hear them. We're also seeing a time where, in particular, I think women of color organizers and a lot of working class women organizers, um, trans and cis, are seen as sort of the rocks of the movement. Though no matter how much they're criticized, threatened, yelled at, um, you know, deemed irrelevant, that they're going to stay because their commitment to movement is unmoving and they're made of steel and they're going to stay no matter what. Um, it's just not true. It's just not true. Experienced organizers become incredibly demoralized as well and need support, need to feel like people have their backs, need to feel like when you make a mistake, people have your backs. And I'm not talking about people who are fundamentally in the work for personal ego gain resources. I'm talking about people who are tried and true and trusted and are going to be making mistakes every single week, every single year and are precious to us and are deeply needed. Infighting is driving some of our best organizers to the brink of leaving the work or leaving the work itself, and that's why the spirituality conversation is so important to me. Two more, underappreciation, again, covered in what I said before, misunderstood and overly relied on, right? So when people don't have a sense of some of the work that is at the heart of organizing, um, often organizers are underappreciated. So one of the ways that this has really played out historically in organizing is around gender assumptions in organizing. So this idea that comes out of a very traditional sense of organizing is pretty patriarchal, right? The straight folks and the, the white men are, you know, inside of a very sort of straight organizing frame. They're the ones that give the motivational speeches, you know, go out and are the visible face of the campaign, um, write the strategy. And, you know, the women and folks of color, the trans folks, the LGB folks are good enough to be sort of behind the scenes um, doing the quote unquote women's work. And I put that in quotes. I actually think it's very important. Making sandwiches, making sure the childcare happens, making sure there's space for the meeting. What, what some folks would call tend and mend organizing now, a very feminist model. Um, in a lot of ways. I think Jason Mogus was the person I've heard say that. Um, when, when we look at that, we really need to question what is the real work of organizing? Because I would actually say everything I just put in both of those lists are really important and people have skills in both that are very important. But understanding that a lot of the invisible work of organizing and who has been historically the leaders of that part of the work are often misunderstood and it is um, I think creates a lot of anger, frustration, and cynicism. Hypercriticism, I think we talked about mostly already. Um, the only part I would add there is that collaboration and problem solving are also something that are either built into our, our organizing muscle memory or not, right? So just like critique gets built in and then that muscle gets stronger, um, we need to make sure that our problem solving muscle is also strong. Um, Many years ago, I used to run an exercise for organizers where I asked them to not 
um, talk in an organizing meeting or criticize what the other organizers were doing until they had some suggestions and they didn't like it at all. But I think almost every single one of them eventually understood the purpose and got a lot better at problem solving. Um, okay, some spiritual tips about organizing. And again, these are just starting points and we want people to be able to engage with each other and share what works for you. So I'm sharing some things that I think about when I'm having a hard time um, in hopes that they're helpful. The liberation of ourselves and of all people and the planet. There's no loftier goal. Remind yourself that is why you're in this work. I have to remind myself this all the time um, and think about um, how much I have to gain and often how little I have to lose um, if I'm just willing, continuing to be willing. Treat relationship building, maintenance, and conflict with deep care. They are the center of this work over the long haul. Um, if there's anything that I've learned over many years in this work, it's that relationships are not disposable and people shouldn't be treated like they're disposable. And that does not mean we have to get along all the time or agree with everyone. But I would just caution, sometimes I see people new this work and they're ready to burn a set of relationships to the ground um, based on actually a not very big um, difference. And then on the other hand, I've seen people um, treat the relationships just very in a very cavalier way by just not being real in the meeting. Just not being real, not honoring each other enough to have a conflict, not saying there's real difference of opinion and not being willing to do that work. And so then it stagnates and no one's actually said the real thing to each other. I have relationships and movement where there's been deep conflict where we didn't connect for a year or five or almost 10 years. And then we're able to come back together and have conversation. Um, I have relationships where um, we've been connected and now we are not as connected, but we're doing things in different areas of the work. And then I have some relationships where we're just agreeing to disagree. We're agreeing to disagree. But finally, I have relationships that I've prioritized where I've really understood that to maintain them and stay in the struggle aligned in the work has been extremely beneficial and I value them so deeply. Um, the main piece of advice I would say is if you're starting out and organizing, don't, don't be cavalier um, with what you say or do. Be willing to step away from the work if you're hurting more than helping. Be willing to come back. Um, I think that, you know, my example of, was a personal example, even though I didn't say it, um, where my frustration or stress or anxiety was actually hurting the meeting or the campaign more than helping. It's really important to be willing to be honest with yourself and not be an egomaniac and think that you have all the answers all the time and you should be the martyr that needs to be there no matter what. You're not always value added. None of us are always value added if we're coming with a really destructive attitude. Um, we'd be better off to like help make sure the food happens for the meeting. Treat other leaders as though if they win, you win, we win. We're going to talk a little bit about an exercise that I designed and sometimes do around this, but I think it's really easy to sort of think that we individually have the best strategy and to spend more time thinking about what do we think than listening to what other people are coming up with and what they're doing, what they're working on. We need to take a ferocious curiosity into how we're looking at movement happening around us and not be waiting for other people to fail, be waiting for them to be on the road to success, see that possibility and realize the people that when they win, we win. Um, root in a practice or a circle of practitioners. For you use engaged in standing on the side of love, that would be one example that's very broad, but making a commitment to a circle of, of accountability. Sometimes we would affectionately call this accountability buddies on something to say, pick one person or a set of people and say, I actually want to consensually be in accountable relationship with you, starting from there. Um, Never be cavalier with other people's safety or dignity. Oh my. Um, I think that this is a really hard one because uh, privilege is real. So 
what feels like a really big risk to some people might not be to other people. Um, what feels like a very risky direct action to a white middle class person may not feel that way um, to someone who has been borderline homeless as a person of color is trans and gender nonconforming. Um, they may feel like they have more at risk to do nothing than to do the something, whatever it is. At the same time, an experienced organizer is not cavalier about other people's safety or dignity. You don't advance a campaign or an action by humiliating anyone. If you don't wanna work with them, just don't work with them. It's not gonna actually pay off in the long run in your relationships. You're gonna scorch the earth around that particular set of people and other folks will start to feel uneasy and push away from you because you're publicly humiliating people um, because they're not down enough or they're not good enough. Um, I think calling people out is a very is a very separate process that sometimes needs to happen. Um, and then I think safety. I would just say that when you're talking about high risk organizing and actions, you need to think about what it's going to look like if you promise someone safety and you can't guarantee it, um, and you make promises you can't keep. Make sure that you're ready for that person's children parents or partner to be phoning you and say you promised this person safety in this situation and you couldn't fall through on it once that's happened to you once once it happens to you once if you have integrity as an organizer it sticks with you and you don't make the same mistake again and then finally a a classic one here with a, a shout out to alice walker because she has a quote very similar to this um never think you were the first one the first one to struggle, the first one to give so much, the first one to fail, the first one to win. Organizing is an ancient art, much, much older than the 1960s, 50s, 30s. Um, people have been struggling, giving a great deal, failing and winning for a long time. And when we choose to isolate ourselves in our martyrdom of thinking it's just us, we forget how much strength there is to pull on from that. So let's talk a little bit about some tools um, to make yourself and try out. Um, so I referenced this one before. This is actually an exercise that I do that's helped me a lot over time. I call it Map of Leaders Morning Meditation. And what I do is sometimes if I'm feeling really grouchy, okay, so what would that grouchiness look like? Sometimes I'm feeling really grouchy, fill in the blank. Well. That person really talked down to me like I don't know what I'm doing or that, you know, I really feel like what I'm bringing and offering is not being seen or why is this strategy so incredibly whack? Why do we need to repeat this? Didn't we do this three years ago? Why are we still doing this? Why are we still having this conversation? Um, and a whole variety of, of things that can come up. I do this meditation. So what I do is I get out a pen and paper and I write a list, depending on how grouchy I'm feeling, I'll do like 20 names or if I'm feeling really grouchy, I'll do like 50 names, right? Um, and I write down the names of organizers that I know that I really respect. I don't have to like them or love them. My list usually has a couple people who are very, very dear to my heart and I'm close to, and, and it has some people that I know from afar. Um, we might not even be friends. We not, might not hang out, um, but I appreciate their work. And I'm like, I see you. I think I see what you're trying to do. I write down the names of those folks. Um, and I always make sure I sprinkle in one or two people that I'm not um, personally much a fan of. Like, we just don't have chemistry, you know, in terms of like, the way we think about things. Uh, they might not really think I'm doing anything with my life, um, but I know that they're doing important things for movement. And I write all their names and then I say all their names after I've written them. And when I say their names, I think back to that phrase, they win, I win, we win. And I just send them a little bit of energy I send them a little bit of energy, hoping that whatever they're working on in that particular day, that's going to go well, 
that they're going to be able to bring their best organizer self to it. It's that it's going to advance the struggle for our peoples. And especially with folks who are not experiencing the same daily realities as I am, the folks on the list who might be um, folks of color, who might be folks who are trans and gender non-conforming, for example, folks who are people with disabilities, I say, you know, may I continue to benefit from the things that they know that our people need that I don't know and understand. And, you know, the thing that's really interesting about doing this is that it never fails that when I'm done, I'm, I start my day thinking about myself a little less and being a little bit less ego-centered because I'm actually kind of a nosy person. So I end up kind of curious, like how actually, I wonder how they are actually doing. Huh. Um, very helpful. Um, okay, a couple more. I'm going to give you a little less detail on the other ones. So touchstone agreements groups, we're going to share a couple samples of what these look like, but I would really encourage when people are working with groups not to just think about agreements that are really specific, like a common one is one mic, right? Like let's have only one person talking at a time. I think it's important to think about what are the core values that you want to center in the work that you're doing together so that you can actually hold each other accountable to that. So um, my longtime comrade, Kara Page, helped helped us many years ago to make some templates for organizing work um, that talked about what values we centered. And one that we always put on our list was patience. And the sentence under it we wrote is, if we're still in movement, someone was patient with us, we need to return that patience to others. And what I found again and again in training organizers is the ones who were the most impatient were like the kind of ones who had been in a year or two not the 10 year ones. Then there was another mode of grouchiness that happened when you ran about 20 years. Um, then there was like also a tendency towards impatience, but those folks that like, we all know them, right? They just learned something and they're turning around popping someone else for not knowing it. And we would constantly use patience to be like, do you get to do that? Cause last time I checked, someone was patient with you. And I know in my own work, the incredible patience people have had with me. So if people have questions about how to make more, um, some of these agreements, you know, we're going to send out a template to check it out. Willing to be transformed quarterly ritual. Ooh, one of the most effective, one of the most challenging. So a little story about this one. Um, many years ago, I started working with my, my lifelong comrade, Paulina Helm Hernandez. And we used to go to this motel by the beach in North Carolina. It was not a very fancy hotel um, to try to stay in our organizing. And every... Every time we would do that, we would go and we would ask each other this question. And the question was, are you willing to be transformed in the service of this work? And I would always cringe when she asked me that question because I knew what would happen if I said yes, which is I really had to ask myself if I was still a yes. And then every time I was still a yes. And then, and then she'd say to me, well, if you're willing to be transformed, I really need you to look in your heart and work on this, 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 and this, this year or this season, and I was like, oh God, now I really, I'm gonna have to really do this work. Um, it's gonna be really helpful um, to ask yourself in pairs, individually, as a group, and I would encourage you to be really honest, and if your answer is, I'm not willing to be transformed right now, um, are you gonna be willing to be transformed again? Do you wanna put a deadline on saying, no, I really wanna, I wanna sit where I am right now? Um, because this work is really asking us to transform all the time. Um, last two, uh, this is a partner prayer, definitely non-denominational, use it as it's helpful, um, purging of cynicism and bitterness. This is something I found really helpful with um, experienced organizers to get in pairs. It's really helpful to find somebody who, um, if you're in year one of this work and they're in year one, you might be a good pair. If you're in year 10 and them year 10, might be a good pair. It's basically similar to the last one. You're giving the other person a chance to talk about what they feel cynical and bitter around. And then you're asking them what it's going to take for them to let go of that and keep it moving. It's a really good thing to not write down everything you feel cynical and bitter about 
in a journal or piece of paper, I would recommend that the part you write down about it is the willingness part. What are you willing to do to let that go? What's it going to take? Um, and then note that. And then the final one, which, you know, this one would be a little experiment, but I was thinking about it the other day, is um, for those folks that are, that are Unitarian Universalists, standing on the side of love has been one of the sort of strongest um, affirmations of people's faith um, as you use and people that I've talked to. And so it'd be great in your groups, um, whether it's for this course or something else, to really think about what does standing on the side of love mean to you in this moment, in movement, in organizing as an individual, and just see what comes up for different folks. Okay, so we're gonna close this baby out um, with a couple of resources. Um, you know, we don't have a ton of resources we're making available for this course, but wanna let people know that there's a lot of different ways people come to this work, and there's some interesting resources out there for people who want to explore more the intersection of movement, organizing, and faith. So obviously the work we're doing, Standing on the Side of Love, we don't need to go into that a lot. If you're interested in some of our emerging work, you know, check us out, particularly the podcast we're starting, which is Stories of the Spiritual Lives of Movement Leaders, which I'm hosting partially because I just want to know. I want to know how other folks are making it and continuing to stay in this work, um, there are a set of some lovely conversations. The Kaleo Center, which is in Minneapolis, would be something worth Googling. Auburn Seminary, similarly, Generative Somatics, is a practice that um, really works for some folks and doesn't work for other folks around building skills, around embodied practice and looking at what's going on with our physical manifestations while we're doing this work and a lot of other work. Faithful Followership, also some work out of Minneapolis, and so many more. I put that on the bottom because I hope that many of you will share on the Facebook group um, other resources you have that you think are important for this work. Um, so, excited to get this conversation started with all of you. Hope you're having a beautiful day. See you next time. <laughs>